Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Philippe Albu. I'm the CEO of the International Osteoporosis Foundation. And today I have the great pleasure to introduce this webinar dedicated to the Mediterranean diet and bone. Today we are extremely lucky to have a well known and well acknowledged speaker, Professor Rene Rizzoli. Professor René Rizzoli, I, I feel extremely humbled to introduce uh, this, uh, this great speaker, great expert. Professor René Rizzoli is indeed an internist and an endocrinologist with a huge expertise in metabolism and bone and osteoporosis. Um, René Rizzoli had a lot of, a lot of um, uh, positions in uh, organizations like USKO. Dr. Rizzoli is indeed a former chairman of the Committee of Scientific Advisors of the IOF. Currently, uh, Professor Rizzoli is also the chairman of the Scientific Advisors of the USKO and co-chairs of the WCO IOF USKO Congress, the scientific program. At the level of IOF, Professor Rizzoli uh, is a board member and a treasurer for years. He has been involved in a lot of, a lot of study both basic and clinical research, investigating pathophysiology of osteoporosis, uh, calcium, phosphate homostasis, and so on. So uh, Professor Rizzoli is also editor-in-chief of Calcified Tissue International and uh, authored uh, more than 900 scientific articles along his impressive career. Professor René Rizzoli, René, it's a great pleasure to welcome you on Bodencast. And now I let you, I let you uh, pursue this webinar. Let's say that the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, today I'd like to speak about Mediterranean diet and musculoskeletal health. When we consider what is a Mediterranean diet, it's a pyramid with some nutrients, some foods which should be eaten daily and some foods less recommended. And let's see together a few of them. So among the food which should be daily ingested, we have cereals, whole grain bread and so on. We have fruit, vegetables, olive oil and dairy products. And then in the less frequent recommended foods, with fish, poultry, potatoes, eggs, and so on. And finally, the less recommended, monthly red meat. But we have seen as well that if we expect that this diet have a positive effect on the health, it will be associated to daily regular physical activity. And then on the right hand side, wine in moderation. And you will see later that red wine is recommended. But why uh, are we recommending this Mediterranean diet? There are several aspects we should be also reminded. Depending on the type of recommendation, we have something which is very precise with the number of servings per day, and then every meal. And you see here three of these recommendations on the right, Greek dietary, Mediterranean diet in the middle, and then preservation and trust, and all the, these recommendations are dealing with the same topic, a Mediterranean diet, with once again, olive oil, vegetables, fruit, and so on. But why this type of diet is popular? Why is it so interesting? It's because over the last decades, it has been demonstrated that such a diet is associated with a reduction of all-cause mortality. And you see here, one meta-analysis indicating that for each two point in the score of adherence to Mediterranean diet, there is a 8% uh, reduction in all cause mortality. And this is true as well for mortality and for incident cardiovascular disease, with here 10% for each two score increase in adherence. And it's true as well for mortality from an incident cancer here we see a 6% reduction. But not only the cardiovascular system and cancer are affected by uh, or associated with the Mediterranean diet, but also uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And you see here 
once again for two point increase in adherence score to Mediterranean diet, there is a 13% reduction in uh, the incident neurodegenerative diseases. Now, and you will see that later, there are several scores to evaluate the adherence to the Mediterranean diet, and these scores are from zero to five or more, and then the sum of these scores uh, will give you an information about the adherence. And among those positive associated, obviously, fruit and vegetables, cereals, and so on, and those negatively associated, red meat, and so on. Now, let's see, uh, one after the other, the various nutrients to be eaten daily in the Mediterranean diet, and how these nutrients are associated with some bone outcome. And we will start by looking at fruits and vegetables and then grain. Fruit and vegetables. You know that the recommendation are five servings per day, but if you reduce the number of servings a day of fruit and vegetable, you will have a marked increase in the risk of a hip fracture. And this is on the left. Now, if you try to look at separately fruit and vegetables, it's the same. Less than a certain amount of servings per day is associated with a marked increase in the risk of hip fracture. And this was uh, observed in a large uh, court study in Sweden. Now, you could ask, but is it related only to this Swedish study? But actually, it seems that in another trial, in, including both men and women, the chances project, you see here, if you compare five or more servings per day, highlighted in red, to one servings per day or less, you see that with one serving or less, you have a higher risk of hip fracture as compared with five servings. And like before, going higher than five servings a day, more than seven servings a day, does not improve anymore, reduce anymore the risk of a hip fracture. So the question you could ask, but if we put everything together, and this has been done on this side, you see here a meta-analysis of the different studies, this clearly a diamond, which is on the left of the vertical line, indicating that a Mediterranean diet, adherence to a Mediterranean diet, is associated with a less hip fracture. Now, the question you could ask, but those are observational studies, and the best in evidence-based medicine is randomized control trial. And I'd like to call your attention on the difficulty to run such a trial, to have an intervention composed of fridge vegetables and other subjects in the control group uh, avoiding these nutrients. And actually, there are at least now, but I know that a large one is ongoing. You see here four different trials, three months intervention trials, a small number of patients or subjects in each group. And there was no difference in terms of serum CTX uh, as a reflection of bone resorption when you eat in these short and small trials uh, fruit and vegetables. So the next question is, but maybe it's an other mechanism. And you know that uh, several of the what we are eating are producing and by metabolism some acid, and some are considered as basic. Uh, or alkaline producing foods. And you see on this slide an evaluation of this capacity to produce acid or to be alkaline. And with a, a formula which is called potential renal acid load, PRAL, with protein and phosphorus as a more favoring acid production and potassium or magnesium or calcium as a preservation. And what you can see here when you have a negative sign, this indicates that these foods are associated with some alkaline pattern. And when you have a positive one, it's uh, associated with a acid pattern. And what you can see here that irrespective of the type of uh, of foods, three of them, bread, rice, spaghetti, which is as 
which are, as you have seen in the pyramid, uh, a very favorable type of food in terms of Mediterranean diet, you see that these bread, rice, and spaghetti are associated with a high PRAL score, indicating that uh, capable of producing acid. And the question is, is this acid production playing a role in the response to Mediterranean diet? And I show you here the evolution of bone mineral density at different sites. And this is a observational study in 65 years old healthy individuals, both men and women, over a six year follow up. And what you can see here, when you classify this patient in, uh, the diet of this patient into alkaline, representing 59%, neutral, 23%, or acidic, 80%. There was no marked difference except that, if anything, those uh, subjects with a so called acidic diet have a lower decrease in bone mineral density, whatever the site you are looking at. And these are the gray column. If you look at the men, this is the dark column. It's the same pattern, but with a loss as expected at this age, a little bit of lower magnitude as compared with uh, women. So this means that probably this long story of acidic pattern is not contributing here to uh, explain the difference in terms of decrease in bone mineral density over time. But what you could also remind is something which is very old. Many years ago, the group in Bern have demonstrated that giving onion, garlic, leek, and so on to rats this was decreasing bone resorption. But in a subsequent paper, the same group demonstrated that this vegetables mediated decrease in bone resorption was absolutely independent of acid base changes. So the third possibility now is that what we are eating in terms of uh, fibers, in terms of fruits and vegetables, are not absorbed, but they are metabolized in the large intestine by the gut microbiota, producing some uh, product of metabolism. And among them, there are the short chain fatty acid like butyrate, acetate, propionate. And you see, dependent on the type of food you are eating, like grain, fruit, and potato, those are associated with a marked production of butyrate in red. Whereas if you look at the fiber pectin or the guar gum insoluble fibers like you find in dairy product or cheese, this is more associated in green with acetate. And the question is, what about the effect of this short chain fatty acid product, product in the large intestine on bone metabolism? And this has been shown in mice in this case, and these mice underwent a orchidect ovariectomy, menopause, and you see that as compared with the sham, the NT, the control group, have, as expected, lost a lot of bone. But when you give some of this propionate butyrate in the drinking water, it's possible not only to blunt the decrease in bone uh, uh, loss, but nearly to correct, to fully pre uh, prevent, particularly with the C4, the butyrate. And this is associated, highlighted in red, with a decrease in bone resorption as reflected by the serum CTX. So fruit and vegetables are able, like grain and cereals, to decrease bone resorption and to reduce the fracture risk. Now let's move to olive oil, which is another important component of the Mediterranean diet. And here there is a lot of the investigation, particularly due to the phenolic compound. And you know that in the taste of olive oil, you have some flavor, but you have also some bitter taste. And this bitter taste is coming from these phenolic compounds. And it appears that it plays a role in cancer, neurodegenerative disease, cardiovascular disease, and also in osteoporosis. And to make the story short, let's look now at the risk of a hip fracture, osteoporotic fracture, 
with a long follow-up of seven years, up to seven days, uh, in relation with the consumption of olive oil separated into tertile. And what you can see here in tertile three, so those with a high olive oil consumption in dashed line, so the cumulative hazard function of undergoing a fracture is lower as compared with tertile one. So in addition to fruits and vegetables you have seen before, here olive oil is associated with a reduction of the fracture risk. Now let's move to another component of the Mediterranean diet is the so-called antioxidant. And here we know that antioxidant mainly found in uh, grains, again, fruits, again, vegetables, tea, chocolate, a little bit in wine, but this highlights as well that it's very difficult to separate the effect one the other. They are core uh, efficacy of, for instance, fruits and vegetables on the production of short chain fatty acid and here in the production of non enzymatic antioxidant capacity. But what is shown on this slide is if you go below the score of 10 in terms of this non enzymatic antioxidant capacity, you have a marked increase in the risk of hip fracture in the elderly. And this was obtained in a large cohort of more than 13,000 uh, male and women over 12 years of follow up. So now let's move to the uh, expression of this uh, non enzymatic effect. And we found uh, this antioxidant particularly in tea and flavonoid. And once again, if you separate the subject, and you will see that on the left hand side, all osteoporotic fracture into tertiles with high, middle, and low consumer of tea and flavonoid. So, and this will make a particular pleasure to our friends from the UK that drinking tea and being with more than three cups a day, this is associated with a lower cumulative risk of a fracture, indicating that once again, you have fruits and vegetables, you have uh, the possibility here with the non-enzymatic antioxidant and the flavonoid to reduce the risk of a fracture. Now let's move to another component of the Mediterranean diet. And we have seen the pyramid that two to three servings a day are recommended in terms of contribution to bone health and muscle health. And here, uh, when we deal with dairy products, we know that it's a very old story, and particularly for fermented dairy products, since some fatty acid specific uh, values reveal that there was some cheese produced in the Mediterranean region, even more than 7,000 before Christmas. So this is not a new story. But what is new probably is the fact that these uh, dairy products are not so bad for the cardiovascular system. And we will speak about now a little bit on the safety before looking at the effect on the, on the musculoskeletal system. And in terms of safety, you see here, when you, in, you supplement a regular Mediterranean diet with dairy products, and this study has been done in Australia, you see that over a twice eight week crossover study, adding further dairy products to a Mediterranean diet is associated with a lower systolic and diastolic blood pressure and higher HDL cholesterol and lower triglycerides. So there is no harm of improving the intake of dairy products on the cardiovascular system. But what about bone? So it seems that if you look now at the calculated bone strengths at the distal radius, distal tibia, this calculated was done using a finite element analysis. So the phenylode is a calculating strength. 
So there is here, clearly, when you look at dairy proteins, a dose response relationship. So those subjects with a higher dairy protein intake have a higher failure load, so stronger bone. When you look at dairy products, you have milk, but you have also fermented dairy products. And here, it's not a cross-sectional study as we've seen before, but a longitudinal one. And here, the subject have been uh, separated into those taking less than one year per day, the black columns, those taking one to six serving uh, a week, sorry, one to six serving a week, and those taking every day at least one year ago. And what you can see here when you look at the cortical area, CT area, cortical volumetric bone mineral density, so the bone loss, the decrease in bone mineral density with time was lower in those with a at least one serving of yogurt per day, indicating that fermented dairy products are associated with a lower rate of bone loss. Now the question is, how are they working, these fermented dairy products? And actually, there are a lot of different possibilities. Calcium, and we know that calcium is implicated in the process of polymerization. We know that in some milk products, there are some prebiotics, and we know that the fermentation of these prebiotics produces uh, short-chain fatty acid with a direct effect, as you have seen before, on bone resorption. But these short-chain fatty acids are playing a role as well on the immune system and playing a role on the intestinal permeability. You have probiotics, particularly in fermented uh, milk products, since you have here some bacteria contributing to modulate the immune system. And finally, you have the protein with an increase in IGF-1, and altogether, you have here some positive, possible positive effect with a decrease in bone resorption and a decrease in bone formation. But is this true in terms of fracture risk? It seems, first of all, that there are several recent meta-analyses, and more or less, they are consistent. More or less, they are indicating that milk, plain milk, is not associated with some reduction or increase in terms of fracture risk. In contrast, cheese, as an example of fermented dairy products or yogurt, does associated with a reduction in the risk, in this case, of all osteoporotic fracture, and this was uh, observed in Caucasian people. There are some larger meta-analyses, but as I said, they are consistent. Now the question is, uh, it seems that consuming some fermented dairy products is good for the bone with low risk of fracture, but what about if we are just avoiding any dairy products? And this is observed in the so-called vegans. And as you know, the vegan diet is devoid of any uh, dairy products. And you see here this meta-analysis published last year in yellow, that the risk of fracture is higher, was higher in the vegans as compared with uh, subject eating of everything, omnivores. And this is true if you look at the bottom of the slide, both in Caucasians and in Asian as well. So avoiding any dairy product is not good for bone with a higher risk of fracture. Let's move now to the last component of the uh, Mediterranean diet, wine and alcoholic beverage. And here, there are several uh, studies indicating that the relationship between uh, bone outcome and the consumption of uh, alcoholic beverages uh, follows a U-shape or inverted J-shape curve. And this is confirmed on this slide. If you look here, the serval valve free of hip fracture so the higher the line, the better in terms of uh, remaining without fracture. Is what you can see here, there is a gray line, which is the highest one. And this is the subject drinking seven to 13 drinks per week. So 
let's say, at least one drink per day uh, of a beverage containing alcohol. And the risk is lower as compared with those without any uh, absorption of, uh, of alcohol in black, and lower as compared with those drinking a little bit more, more than 14 drinks per week. So it seems that a small amount of uh, alcoholic beverage is not so bad and probably favorable on the risk of fracture. And the question you could ask, but which type of, uh, of drink? And here, using the data collecting the frame of the WHI, WHI uh, study with more than 100,000 subjects, with a mean number of serving of three per week. And what you can see here after adjustment for different potential confounders, that women who preferred wine were at lower risk as compared with non-drinker, past drinker, infrequent drinkers, hard liquor drinkers, beer drinkers, and those without strong preferences. And I will not show you, but in another study, which is the North Health study, it seems that the red wine is playing the role of uh, preventing uh, bone loss and fracture risk and not the white wine. So the red wine should be included in the Mediterranean diet. So, but as you know, we are eating foods, we are not eating nutrients. And what matters is to see the effect overall of a Mediterranean diet, not the effect of each uh, component on bone health and the risk of fracture. And as I said, to evaluate the adherence of, to a Mediterranean diet, you use some scores with the more you eat, for instance, the vegetable, the higher will be the score. The more you eat some red meat, the lower will be the score. So now, if we look at the effect or the association between the uh, adherence to a Mediterranean diet and bone mineral density, and this is a meta-analysis published two years ago, you see that irrespective of the skeletal side, lumbar spine, femoral neck, and so on, always the, the, the diamond, the blue diamond, is on the right side of the vertical line with some effect size of approximately 0.12 for lumbar spine, indicating that subjects adhering to a Mediterranean diet have a higher level of bone mineral density. But those are observational diet, and we will say, well, what about a randomized control diet, which is, as we know, the best in terms of evidence-based medicine? And here we have actually one trial, which is only one year, conducted in nearly normal subjects. A few of them were osteoporotic. And if you look at the upper part of the slide, all participants, there was no difference in terms of evolution of bone mineral density over one year uh, in this, this subject. But now if you look specifically to those with a diagnosis of osteoporosis, it seems, and this is highlighted in red, that the decrease in bone mineral density at the femoral neck level over one year was prevented or blunted by some intervention, including a Mediterranean diet. So it seems that GMD is better with the Mediterranean diet. But now the question you could ask, what about the fracture? And this in an example, what I was referring to before, these panels refer to two different scores of adherence to a Mediterranean diet. On the left, the AMED, on the right, the MDS. And the data are a little bit different, but you will convene that the pattern is the same. So if you look at all types of fractures, more than 25,000 subjects, 70 years of follow-up. So you can see here that there is a decrease, a reduction in the highest quintile as compared with the lowest quintile of 23% on the left, 17% on the right. And if you look specifically to the hip fracture, it was minus 21%. And this is the most recent one. But this confirm or is in agreement with previous study 
That one is a meta-analysis uh, looking at the association between uh, the hip fracture incidence and adherence to Mediterranean diet. In the upper part, in men, there was no significant difference, but in the bottom, there was clearly a low risk in this meta-analysis of various accord in Greece, Sweden, US, and against Sweden. So it indicates that in other type of uh, subjects, it's possible to detect, particularly in women, a reduction in the risk of the hip fracture in subjects adherent to Mediterranean diet. And this is true when you look here on the left-hand side in Sweden, and other coral, on the right-hand side uh, to the north and study. And you see here, there is a reduction in the risk of hip fracture on a dose-dependent basis. If you look on the left-hand side, the higher the Mediterranean diet score, the lower the risk of fracture. And the same on the right-hand side, with uh, a 20% reduction in the fifth quintile, so the subject with a score superior to six. And this was associated with a increase in the gut microbiota diversity, which is supposed to be better, and with some decrease in cholesterol, inflammation markers, and in the insulin resistance. So it is much better. And all these data have been now collected, included in a meta analysis. And what you can see here that uh, the risk of a hip fracture is lower in those patients adhering to a Mediterranean diet. And in this case, there was a 21% reduction. And once again, it appears that there is a dose response relationship. The higher the score, the lower the risk of a fracture. So as you know, if we are breaking a bone, it's both the consequence of osteoporosis, so a low bone strength, a low bone mineral density. And you have seen before that the higher the score in terms of Mediterranean diet adherence, the lower the risk of fracture. But the second component in the fracture is the risk of falling, since uh, at least 95% of the hip fracture are occurring following a fall. And first of all, if we look now particularly on the left-hand side, the adherence to a Mediterranean diet here evaluated by the MDS, one of these scores. And if you look at the leg explosive power, which is in black, you see that adhering to a Mediterranean diet is associated with a marked higher leg explosive power, which is in terms of magnitude, much higher as compared to just the fat-free mass or the muscle mass. And this effect of muscle function and endurance appear to be very quick. If we refer to this recently published paper, where they measured the time required to run five kilometers. And comparing a Mediterranean diet to a Western diet, and you see here that within only four days of switching to a Mediterranean diet, it was possible to reduce the time to complete a five kilometer run. Uh, and this was significant statistical point of view. And on the right hand side, that this lower time required to run this uh, five kilometers was uh, detectable at each kilometers, indicating that you don't need to uh, follow uh, Rididad diet for years to see the benefit of the muscle and endurance function. And the last point is, what about the risk of falling? And you see here on this slide, and there are several models, and I will not go into details, but if you just look at what is highlighted in red, the risk of one or more falls with another score, the MEDAS in this case, uh, separated according to three tertiles. And you see on the right hand side, belonging to the third tertiles, so those subjects with a higher adherence of Mediterranean diet, 
This was associated, irrespective of the model, with a marked reduction in the risk of falling more than 25%. So not only is this Mediterranean diet is good for the bone, but it's good as well on mass cell function and particularly the risk of falling. And the last question now is, what about the potential mechanism? You have seen before that it's possibly in relation with the gut microbiota. And if you put everything together, this could be summarized as well. Uh, we have in the diet, particularly the Mediterranean diet, some prebiotics, probiotics, polyphenols, unsaturated fat. And if you look now at the right hand side, prebiotic associated with less lipopolysaccharide, less IL-6 and more IL-10. Probiotics, polyphenols, less C-reactive proteins, so less inflammation. So one of the first component, and maybe one of the major one in terms of efficacy on all the different uh, systems of a Mediterranean diet is to decrease the low grade of inflammation associated with aging, which has been called by our colleague uh, Claudio Franceschi, like uh, inflammaging. And to mediate this decrease in inflammation, we have once again the gut microbiota. And this has been shown in the large uh, European uh, study, New Age. And here I just uh, show you the conclusion. Adherence to the Mediterranean diet led to increased abundance of specific taxa that were positively associated with several markers of lower frailty and improved cognitive function. Once again, this Mediterranean diet is uh, concerning a lot of different systems in the body and negatively associated with inflammatory markers, including C-reactive protein and interleukin 17. These associations were independent of host factors, such as age and body mass index. And the inferred microbial metabolite profile indicating that the diet modulating microbiome change was associated with an increase in short grain ch uh, chain fatty acid, you have seen, uh, butyrate, propionate, and lower production of secondary bile acid like paracresols, ethanol, and carbon dioxide. And this is probably the, la the link between what we are eating in terms of uh, food and bone and muscle function. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleague, you see once again, this pyramid of medieval diet. So what is recommended every main meal or every day is on the left-hand side, there is olive oil, fruit, vegetables. On the right-hand side, bread, pasta, once again, olive, and to add some taste in terms of salt, herbs, spice, and garlic. And then less frequently highlighted in the blue, uh, legumes, red, and processed meat. And don't forget, if you are allowed to do so, to accompany this food with some wine, in particular red wine. With this conclusion, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rowane, for this um, amazing presentation that indeed uh, was very extensive and very comprehensive, showing the, the benefit of uh, the Mediterranean diet on the bone metabolism. In fact, we received uh, plenty of questions, but as a, friend, as, a, as a French, I cannot resist not to start by the question related to the positive impact of wine on the bone metabolism. So the first question is the following. Is there more Reves, sorry for that, Reves Ratrol in Reves red wine? Ratrol. Yes. Thank you, Rene. You are more okay. expert than me. In red okay. wine, compared to white wine, and does this explain the better antioxidant effect of red wine? OK. So what is attributed to the effects of the red wine is the resveratrol present in the red grapes, which is less present in the white grapes. But the point I want to make is that wine is not a treatment of osteoporosis, but it could be the reflection of some uh, healthy behavior 
somebody uh, drinking one glass of wine uh, every day, somebody probably it takes time to eat, to enjoy the meal, instead of running uh, and uh, drinking too much. So it could be some confounder as well, but we have as a mechanism, as you suggested, the resveratrol, and there are some in vitro data indicating that bone cells uh, seems to be a little bit happier when incubated with resveratrol. But it's not a treatment of osteoporosis, obviously. Obviously, but we took uh, seriously your recommendations regarding the way to, to, take, uh, to take the meal, obviously. Uh, thank you, Rene. Um, maybe uh, other question, uh, questions related to diet for postmenopausal women. So basically, the question is the following. In early postmenopausal women, how much do you think that a diet rich in calcium and vitamin D could reduce the bone loss per year? Early postmenopausal women. Okay, so what we know in early postmenopause women with a loss of bone mineral density of uh, 2%, even more during the first few years, we know that the best, the highest efficacy is achieved with menopausal hormone therapy. So this means with estrogen progesterone. And we know as well that calcium vitamin D is probably a minor. Uh, component of the in terms of efficacy. Uh, we know that later in life, the association of calcium and vitamin D is associated with a small reduction in the risk of fracture. But in terms of prevention of bone mineral density immediately after the menopause, it's relatively difficult to detect a significant effect. Okay, thank you. It's, it's very clear. Um, another questions, uh, question, Rene, related to the diet and also the lifestyle. Very interesting. The question is the following. It seems that persons who take Mediterranean diets are more conscious of their health and lifestyle. How do you exclude the food preference of the subjects? I guess that the question is related indeed to the overall lifestyle of the, of the people more uh, attracted by the by the Mediterranean diet. Do we have any evidence uh, or any way to, to exclude this uh, bias? No, no. The, we could uh, give two answers. The first one, the Mediterranean diet is based on the Cretan diet, which has been followed for uh, centuries, even not uh, millenniums. And this was not, it was a natural food which was available in Crete in the uh, Greek island. So in this case, you cannot uh, speculate that the positive association between bone health and the Mediterranean diet is due to a, would say, a healthy behavior. But now if you move from Crete and the Greek island to other countries, it's a very good possibility that those subjects following carefully a, a, a Mediterranean diet are those with a healthier behavior, in particular also regular physical activity, uh, regular meal, uh, not an imbalanced meal with all the calories in the evening. And this is a clear possibility that uh, those subjects following a Mediterranean diet have also healthier behavior. This has been particularly invoked for the yogurt story. And the yogurt mm. could be as well a reflection of the quality of life, the, the, the quality of the food ingested. Thank you, Ronnie, for, for your answer. Another question regarding the diet and the lifestyle. Of course, uh, I guess that you appreciated the emergence in the society of different fashion, fashions uh, regarding the, the regimen. And notably, we have a question regarding, uh, regarding the, the impact of uh, this um, new way to, 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 to eat, notably in the management of people allergic, you know, with allergic to the dairy product, but also, you know, people who are not taking um, gluten, uh, taking only gluten-free food, if you see what I mean. Do, do we have any data on, the, on that? 
Uh, presently, I would say two things. The first one, in the Mediterranean diet, you have the cereals, as, as you know, pasta and bread are rich in gluten, but rice is poor, so you could replace a, uh, a gluten-rich uh, cereal by rice and uh, gluten-depleted foods. Now, for the allergy to, to dairy products, there are two types. There's a real allergy to the proteins. And to my knowledge, the frequency could be as high as 17%, uh, particularly in kids. And this could be reduced by the different type of casein. And you know, yeah, there's a casein 1 and casein 2. And you can breed some cows with more of the one type of casein, which is less allergenic than the other. And there's also the possibility, particularly with milk, of uh, lactase uh, deficiency. And what we call allergy may be some intolerance of lactase. So there are these two aspects. And maybe lactase is uh, deficiency, particularly in Asian population, is probably more frequent than the allergy to, 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 the, to the casein. Thank you, Rene. I have a, also a very technical and uh, high-level question. That is the following. The observation of a reduction in hip fraction in women adherent to Mediterranean diet is not confirmed in men. Can this just reflect the lack of power of the association in males since the number of females seems to be fivefold greater than males? What do you think, Rene? Uh, that, well, if you look carefully, there are some large cohort, uh, nearly as high as in women with men, and still the efficacy is difficult to detect. Many of the data are with both men and women both together. But you know as well that the, the adherence to a diet is sometimes more strictly followed by a woman as compared with a man. And this is known as well for the adherence to a, a drug. Uh, we know that it's easier to convince a lady to take regularly a, a pill as compared to a man. So maybe this is uh, the possibility. And finally, uh, maybe, but this has not been carefully tested so far, maybe the, the gut microbiota is uh, sex dependent, and maybe there is here some difference, but this is an open question and probably should fit, belong to the research agenda in the future. Thank you. Another, another question related to the association of the Mediterranean diet and the lifestyle. The question is related to the regular exercise and more precisely, what is the contribution of the regular exercise component um, with the Mediterranean diet, I guess, on the bone metabolism and not fully on the prevention of fragility fractures? So if I understand the question is, uh, are these two interventions not related? Okay or do they uh, display some synergism? The, the question is a bit incomplete, but I guess that is related to the possible positive effect, uh, effect of the combination between a positive of regular physical exercise and a Mediterranean diet. This is my understanding. So what we know, for instance, in young individual, and I refer to, to some study performed in Canada, we know that the effect on bone and muscle uh, physical exercise is magnified, is increased by uh, taking some dairies. So there is certainly some interaction between physical activity and uh, some of the Mediterranean components. Now, to further investigate the interaction, I'm still not trying to think how to do it, but it's probably feasible. Okay, and um, a more a questions more a question more related to basic uh, basic science. So let's go back to the the cells responsible of the modeling and the re, and the bone remodeling, the osteoblast and osteoclast. The question is: Is there a direct effect of the Mediterranean diet on the bone modeling and remodeling? Do we know that? Do we have any data? So we could. Uh, come back to each nutrient separately. So first, 
if we take the protein, we know that certain type of protein, particularly uh, the, those containing some aromatic amino acid, are stimulating IGF-1 production in the liver, and this will increase the production of 125 in the kidney. So there is here the possibility of an increase in bone formation with 125. Then, on the other hand, we have the calcium, and we know that calcium is uh, slightly decreasing bone resorption. And we know we have all this indirect effect through the butyrate story, which is in the paper I was referring to by Lucas and collaborator, very impressive, giving butyrates produced by the GAT macrobiota uh, to mice was associated with a marked reduction in bone resorption. So here we have a, a, an effect. And if now we refer to the very old paper by Mulbauer more than 20 years ago, he gave some uh, onion and so on to, to rats and measuring bone resorption with a system which is not anymore uh, applied, which was to see the excretion of tetracycline from the bone which has been preloaded for different for several weeks. It was possible by giving these uh, vegetables to rats to detect a marked decrease in bone resorption. So it seems that clearly, yes, bone rebounding is affecting by several of the Mediterranean components. It's really fascinating, and thank you for this clear answer, uh, Professor Rizzoli. We have still um, five minutes ahead, and in fact, um, I have still two questions, uh, René. Uh, at the level of IOF, as you well know, as, a, as a board members and treasurer of IOF, we are really promoting the prevention of osteoporosis, and definitely a good regimen uh, could help to prevent at least the bone loss and to, the bone loss and to improve the bone quality. And there, there, time to times, you know, there, there are always the questions coming related, related to the uh, possible harmful effects of the dairy products. So could you please uh, uh, share with us a clear answer regarding the possible or debated harmful effects of the dairy products uh, on the bone metabolism? On the bone or the cardiovascular as well? I could both try actually, to really both actually. Okay. Yeah, you're you're okay. right. Both are important. Okay. What has been clearly established is when you take too much saturated uh, fatty acid, you have an increase in atherosclerosis and a higher risk of cardiovascular event. Now the issue is when you take food and not looking at specific one of the components. And it seems, and this has been over the last few years, repeatedly demonstrating that if you eat some dairy products, it's not bad for the cardiovascular system. Even there is a reduction in the cheese eater of the mortality. But once again, you will say that maybe the cheese eater are those uh, performing more physical exercise or having a less harmful type of, uh, of uh, way of life. So this cannot be excluded, but at the present time, dairy products are not bad for the cardiovascular system, at least in the frame of a normal, regular uh, intake. I don't know, as a Swiss, if uh, eating one fondue at each meal is true as well. Now regarding bone, there are a lot of data indicating that there is no decrease the risk of fracture with milk. And here there's a debate, what is the cause, whether it's because there is some galactose and so on in it. But what has been repeatedly shown in several meta-analyses, that yogurt, which is a fermented dairy product, is associated with a decrease in the risk of all type of fracture, hip fracture, and maybe it's the, nearly the same with cheese as well. So it's not bad for bone to have some dairy products uh, in, the, in the menu of uh, the patients suffering of osteoporosis. Thank you. Thank you very much, René. And before concluding this, uh, this very interesting session, last question, maybe 
a bit more technical regarding um, regarding the studies. In fact, in this kind of topic, it's quite difficult, I guess at least, uh, to set up randomized clinical trial, uh, double blind, and so on. So the question is, what, how you will uh, interpret, or what is your your opinion regarding the robustness of uh, the, the observational studies versus the RCT? in this specific topic related to diet, for instance? I fully agree. First of all, it will not be possible to have a double blind, since uh, if you add some food in the diet, it, it's obviously not uh, blinding. The second point will be the compliance, because it's not so easy to have regularly enough of all these uh, foods in the diet. And the third point is, that maybe the magnitude of the effect is not as great as we could expect and we need many many patients to get a uh, sufficient power and finally as you already suggested before the adherence to vegetarian diet could be also the reflection of uh, the uh, healthy behavior uh, which would contribute to better bone and less fracture obviously Thank you very much, uh, René. It's time now to, to conclude this, uh, this webinar. Do you have a final, uh, final uh, a key message or take-home message to, to share with uh, uh, our attendees? No, I thank them very much for being there. I think it's a fascinating story to try to decrease the risk of a fracture just by uh, improving our dietary intakes with a qualitative and quantitative uh, modification. And let's see now in the future whether it's possible to uh, organize some intervention trial of sufficient power to demonstrate what the observational studies have suggested. Thank you, thank you, René. Um, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of IOF for your participation in this webinar. The topic was definitely exciting and um, we really do appreciate the fair, the, the, the well-balanced presentation based on the, on the studies and uh, sharing with us your own uh, expertise uh, on this matter. Thank you very much for your time. I would like also to thank all the attendees who attended uh, this, uh, this meeting today. Please take in mind that BoneCast is an, an IOF program and we have regular webinar uh, each and every month. Also, I'd like to share the information that this uh, webinar, this session has been recorded and will be available on the IOF website, on the IOF website. Thank you very much to all and I hope to, to see you again in the next webinar session again. Warm thanks, uh, René, for your, your kind uh, involvement in this, uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Stay safe all and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.